The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. A remarkable man um, with a long history, long. I mean, he was uh, one of the key people in the reform of British science from, you know, sort of uh, a intense but nevertheless uh, fairly gentlemanly uh, pursuit to moving it into institutions in England. And uh, Huxley was identified with the Royal School of Mines. Uh, that's where he was uh, appointed after, th after he came back from his rattlesnake voyage. Uh, and then he was instrumental in the establishment of uh, the Imperial College of Science and Technology. So he became uh, one of the key people in moving it from down in the area of uh, Piccadilly up to Knightsbridge and building it up into one of the great institutions. He was one of the inaugural speakers, the inaugural speaker at the establishment of Johns Hopkins University. He came over to America, traveled in America, and uh, said, uh, uh, I mean, he was incredibly articulate. He, he just had a, a way with uh, language that uh, he, he, could both, he could write fairly detailed, uh, complicated scientific papers, but he could turn around and write an essay that could be published in a journal. And, be read by thousands and thousands of people. So he, he had this versatility with language. And he was, uh, he was a pretty aggressive promoter of science. You know, he, he uh, became known as Darwin's bulldog because uh, he had this kind of, uh, he, liked, he liked debate, vigorous debate. And uh, when uh, evolution was debated, in polite circles, uh, in university locations, uh, by people who were trying to present it in an unfavorable light. Huxley was quite happy to step up to the stage and debate uh, evolution itself, even though evolution at the time was, some, was, was often s unpopular. So uh, Huxley, Huxley really became an advocate for approaching knowledge with a objective, clear sense of uh, not bringing bias and so forth into the picture, trying to just see what the facts. Uh, he's, he's one of his quotes was, uh, uh, sit down before uh, fact as a little child and just learn from the facts and see what you can make of them and try to in, uh, eliminate uh, biases. So. Uh, he really was uh, a key figure in the 19th century, an advocate for just open approach to knowledge and to pursuing knowledge for knowledge's sake, uh, just for the, the love of learning. Uh, and definitely he was more than happy to face off with the consequences of whatever he learned. Um, he was. Uh, uh, as Devin said, he was a, a comparative ana anatomist, a morphologist. He studied, uh, uh, he studied in, in the framework of uh, uh, evolution, paleontology. Uh, he definitely, and he also was uh, 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 someone who did uh, a lot in science education. He wrote the classic papers of science education in the 19th century. So. And uh, the, the reform of education, the education that Butler talks about in Erewhon, uh, the uh, uh, Colleges of Unreason, where you learn the hypothetical language and so forth, Butler was making a, he was satirizing the, the curriculum of uh, English University of those days that he had encountered at Cambridge, uh, where the emphasis was on learning Latin and uh, getting grounding in theology and, and uh, uh, classical thought, but uh, without any kind of uh, uh, 
any kind of uh, access to practical knowledge. So uh, Huxley was the answer to that in many ways. He, he brought in the arguments that uh, science education was uh, not only important in the intellectual sense, but it was an important part of becoming a mature society to become knowledgeable about science. Uh, contemporary society could learn a lot from Huxley because uh, we, we don't necessarily embrace those principles even now, and that is uh, we, sometimes, uh, uh, we sometimes limit the, uh, the time and significance we attribute to scientific uh, knowledge and spend our time on other, other matters that are less, uh, less urgent. Uh, which is not to say that Huxley was all about urgency, but uh, he was a big, robust personality, and uh, he definitely thought a lot about his contemporary society. Uh, so science was important. He loved science. He loved the pursuit of science, but he also saw the larger society and tried to place his knowledge in, in, into the context of large, larger society. And that's really the source of our essay today. Uh, which is his, uh, his introduction to evolution and ethics, called uh, uh, Prolegomena. And uh, um, this, this work is, touches on many and many of the themes that we've been talking about, many, many of the books. He references lots of the works that we've come across. And there are even, there are even allusions to things that Butler and others have said, but certainly Malthus is a presence in this, in this piece of work. Um, okay, so uh, here you have, um, uh, so in, in Evolution and Ethics, Huxley's, uh, he develops this whole dialogue, this whole discourse on the two states. The fact that uh, there's a state of nature and then there's a state of art. And I mean, it's, a, it's something we can debate because, you know, it's not necessarily uh, a, a, a pat distinction, and we'll get into that a little bit. As I said, he did become known as Darwin's bulldog because he came out. He became a very vigorous advocate for evolution, and this was not always popular. So he sometimes uh, found himself on the public stage, uh, and there's a uh, there's sort of a celebrated encounter between him and Bishop Wilberforce. Many people have written various things, and you know it's been kind of uh, expanded into sort of a cultural myth because it was the clash between the man of science, the rationalist, and the theologian who was based in you know the traditions of uh, the religious texts, and uh, you know they sort of clashed on stage in front of a bunch of undergraduates <laughs> at Oxford who were you know whooping and howling and you know all sort of uh, watching this kind of uh, face-off between these two uh, distinguished uh, uh, sort of authorities. And uh, anyways, he, <laughs> he got quite a bit of notoriety from that. He also published, you recall, I mentioned one of his books earlier, Man's Place in Nature, uh, which was a work that was published uh, 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 right around the time of the origin of species and uh, a little bit before, and uh, uh, in, that, in that work he argued that humans were simply to be seen within the framework of primates. He did not make a, an explicit argument that they, were that they had derived from a common ancestor. That, that wasn't his purpose. His purpose in his, his book, Man's Place in Nature, was simply to frame the human body, its structure, uh, its, its status as an organism within the context of the natural world and to say humans are natural entities or they have to be thought of as primates. And uh, this was a very bold thing to do at this time and he was, he was cautioned by a number of people including Charles Lyell that this was pushing, pushing the envelope a little far but he loved sort of doing that, so that was part of his personality. Um, so yes, uh, he, 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 on the religious thing, he just said, 
You know, he, he, had, he didn't have the uh, authority to disprove religion, and he did not have the uh, evidence to, uh, to accept it. So he called himself an agnostic. It's just, for him, the word agnostic just meant it's not within the realm of his, his uh, ability to either prove or disprove. And, uh, and so this has become a, quite a, a controversial term. Uh, but, uh, okay, so he, uh, and, and, and then a the quote, and then we'll, uh, his quote was, sit down before fact as a little child, be prepared to give up every preconceived notion, follow humbly wherever or, where or whatever abysses nature leads, or you will learn nothing. And you recall Norbert Wiener, he said the, the, he said the same thing in his, his essay, uh, which was published years and years later, of course, that um, you know, uh, the, the searcher for knowledge must be prepared to entertain her heretical notions in the pursuit of knowledge. All right, so uh, evolution and ethics. Um, this was, uh, this was one of Huxley's uh, final works, and um, it was uh, a, a set of essays that he uh, uh, produced in 1893, 19, 1893 and 1894, uh, which were part of a lecture series, a Romanus lecture series. So he was invited to give a lecture by one of his friends, uh, George Romanus. And he delivered, uh, he delivered the essay Evolution Ethics first, and then he delivered an introduction to it. Because the essay itself was really just the length of a public talk, and he felt he really had to add more context to it. So that's the part that I asked you to read. Uh, it's called a prolegomena. It's just the introduction to Evolution Ethics. So what is his... Uh, what is his what, what, what's Huxley concerned about in this essay? And what are some of the, what are some of the topics? How does he set this up? Yeah, yeah Chris. Uh, it puts forth a state of nature and a state <coughs> of art. State of nature being the, the, the state of a land or a place before the intervention of human, before human intervention. And the state of art being, it's the environment after humans have been introduced. He acknowledges that the world of Darwin and the world of, of nature itself is, uh, he notes that, you know, this is a prevailing state. This is a sort of cosmic state, if you will. Uh, you know, the earth has emerged uh, at a certain point in its, its history of time into the natural landscapes that we're familiar with when we go out into the wilderness or into undeveloped areas. And in Huxley's day, of course, there was much more of this. I mean, sometimes a modern a person, a modern urban liver uh, a, 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 a inhabitant uh, has a very hard time finding these locations. We go to parks and places like that and see if we can find nature um, because human is... But, you know, this whole concept of a state of nature that this is the normal way things are, and that uh, you know uh, it's it's basically uh, part of uh, the extension of the cosmos. Basically, uh, he says, measured by a liberal scale of timekeeping of the universe, this present state of nature, however it may seem to have gone and to go on forever, is but a fleeting phase of her infinite variety. Turn back a square foot of the thin turf. In the solid foundation of the land, exposed in cliffs of chalk, 500 feet high on the adjacent shore yields full assurance of a time when the sea uh, covered the site of the everlasting hills. This is a point, and his, there's a lot of irony. I mean, Huxley's very good with you know, making these little twists, but the fact that we think of these as uh, the South Downs in England as you know, everlasting hills and so forth, well, as a matter of fact, they've been under the ocean uh, more than once. So, you know, the, this notion, so what emerges from this, this concept of nature? He says there's, there's, there's one principle 
in all this that we can say runs through the whole thing? What is it? Yeah. Um, quote, all entities in the universe, Huxley argues, oh, actually, that's my quote, never mind. All, <laughs> entity, all entities in the universe, not those of just a biological or origin, are undergoing evolution. And the big, so that's, that's the big theme, is that it's not just living things, but it's the rocks and the, yeah. the any kind of organized system, you know. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah and the, the, the one permanent thing is not some form, but the permanent thing is change. There's, there's, there's nothing that's going to stay the same. Everything is changing constantly. Life forms are changing. Land forms are changing. Uh, the world is part of a, an incredible array of uh, 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 cosmic substance that is constantly undergoing shifts and change. And humans sort of sit within one little time one little speck of time within this vast system of change. And what's in their interests? What do they do about change? Why, uh, what are the, what's the point of trying to create a state of art? Stop yeah, it's, it's basically <laughs> to stop the change from happening or at least to control it. I mean, that's what civilization is, is trying to do at some level. Is, is to counter this constant change of the natural forces so that we can create a level of stability within, we can, within which we can live. And that's the concept of the colony. Yeah, we ironically call it forward progress, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to so. say. Yeah. <laughs> Claire? Oh, no, well, just like, I wouldn't have automatically thought that we as a species were trying to stop change. Like it seems like we make all this technology and do all the things that we do in order to improve and in, in improving we're yeah. changing. Yeah. But then like, there is like the need for stability too, which was like Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, it's good. Charles? I'm all of a sudden reminded of uh, Wordsworth's poem that we read at Derek yeah. Street. Yeah. The Concern Abbey. Yes. And like just the just the struggle, not the struggle, but like kind of just the dynamics between man, man and nature, kind yeah. of like neglect, like just active forces on one side will try to take over the other. Yeah. And so like that, that kind of conflict, I guess, is discussed yeah. here as well. Well, that's a that's an excellent point because Wordsworth is, you know, what what is his position with regard to nature and change? I mean, doesn't he want to, he, he wants to live within it. He wants to, you know, somehow accept it. And not to completely, I mean, you know, if you want to see an expression of the desire to stop change, uh, just go look at, you know, John Hancock building or something, you know. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a stable environment within, inside the tower, uh, and in that uh, tower we control... Uh, and we set up a very stable system in which we can walk around without, clo you know, without coats and things of that sort and go about our business. But, you know, we can't have rainstorms coming in <laughs> into the... I mean, we are constantly trying to create a sort of uh, a, a, a framework around ourselves and to keep the forces of uh, the, the sort of uh, uncontrolled forces of nature on the outside and control our inside environment. At least this is Huxley's position. Um, so he, uh, as he says uh, in the bottom here, he's talking about evolution now. You know, he's, he's, he's really just saying that, you know, evolution is really talking about this, this, this idea of change that things constantly change, that over millennia they will, one form will uh, descend into other forms and uh, uh, nothing, nothing stays the same. So, so he says, the word evolution, evolution now generally applied to the cosmic process, has had a singular history and is used in various senses. Taken in its popular signification, it means progressive development, that is gradual change from a condition of relative uniformity to one of relative complexity. But its connotation has been widened to include the phenomena of retrogressive metamorphosis, that is, of progress from a condition of relative complexity to one of relative uniformity. So evolution can go in all directions. 
it's not necessarily uh, uh, consistent with our concept of progress, where you know things always get better and more stable. Okay, so he has this state of nature, uh, to which he, to which he matches this uh, what he calls the state of art. Uh, and I have to say, this was this was not simply accepted. A lot of people, a lot of people rejected this this argument of Huxley's, and even scientific colleagues of his uh, were upset that he he tried to argue that the state of art was different from the state of nature because why would this, what would be the problem, what, what are the problem of saying that humans uh, are somehow opposed to nature uh, by creating the state of art and that the state of art and the state of nature are, are, are opposed? What are some of the problems in that argument? Well, maybe the first, somebody's recording next door, is that it? We have a little background here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what is the state of art? Let's just see what what he's. Uh, what are some examples? It's okay. It's a little background. isn't gonna isn't gonna hurt anything. Um, what 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 is the state of art? Yeah, David. Is the state of art? <coughs> Like things that man uh, uses slash creates for man's benefit. Yeah, right. it's it's uh, the sort of built environment that we're so familiar with. Uh, we build an environment uh, for ourselves to live in. Um, I mean, you could say there are certain organisms that do uh, you know similar things. Uh, there are termites that build towers that they live in. There are beavers that build beaver dam, uh, hot dams and huts and everything they love. So, you know, uh, birds build nests. So there are a lot of organisms that create built environments. So what's different about humans? You can't really take creativity away from like the beaver or the ant because it, it's amazing that they figure out and that they build these things that are so functional and what they need them to do. But there is like the art form that you're talking about behind human building, like, we don't just take wood and make something to cover ourselves with when it rains, you know, we paint the walls and we, like, try to make it look pretty. And there are places like, have you ever seen the Pompidou Center in, um, in France? They have all of the plumbing and everything on the outside, it's just like a show of everything that humans, and there's like the escalator on the outside, and, you know, we don't need escalators, we could just be on one floor, but we choose to okay. express ourselves like that further bit than other species. So there's ingenuity that, uh, I mean, this comes back to our concepts of design. Uh, I mean, there is design in a beaver dam, is there not? There is design in a beaver hut. There is design in a... I think. Yeah. Uh, Whereas in humans, a lot of things are purely aesthetic. Okay, so I think that's what you were getting at, right? That we not only create function, but we create beauty. Uh, we create so, and it comes back to this word creativity. What is the basis? What is driving this building in, in Darwin's? Remember chapter seven, instinct. What, what's driving this building? It's fundamentally instinctual based, is it not? Do you think it's uh, Do you think it's any different for humans? Do we build out of instinct? Well, no, I, I was saying, you know, uh, when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about animals uh, with, uh, except uh, humans, we see a lot of building in those, uh, in the worlds of uh, organisms, build all kinds of structures. Yeah. Well, I think it's kind of weird. I think we kind of originally build stuff to get away from nature, like, yeah. like to get out of, so we can control the climate and yeah, we don't yeah. be in the rain all the time. But then once we add art back to it, it's almost like we're trying to return to nature by making a pretty picture like that. So it's yeah. something we would see in nature. Yeah, yeah. And so we're, we're, it's, it's almost like we're getting out of it 
no. just to get back into it by adding this okay. form to it. But to um, get back in more comfortably. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we, we definitely want to uh, create a, a, a situation for ourselves that we can live more comfortably in. Who wants to get rained on? You know, I mean, I mean, maybe some people do, but most people want to be able to do uh, other things and just sit there in the rain. So, you know, humans, humans share a desire uh, with other organisms that create these environments. What's, what's the point of a, bee's, uh, a beehive? I mean, the whole point is to create some kind of a stable environment so that, you know, they can reproduce, they can live and thrive and so on and so forth. So, in many ways, don't we share the same impulse, except that we have, you know, we have intellectual fun uh, capabilities that can take these principles and rationalize them and understand, I mean, and, and, and expand them into more and more complex and powerful ways of achieving these same ends. I mean, isn't that sort of what MIT is doing? A lot of MIT is doing is trying to create better environments and better structures, better materials, better, I mean, what's the point of the research that's going on in all our laboratories here if, if it isn't to somehow create a better environment for ourselves? That's where, that's where the end products <coughs> of these understandings and these technological uh, applications go into our environment someplace doing something with our environment, our conditions of existence. So, uh, just, uh, so the question I have is, is the state of art itself that Huxley says is different and opposed to nature? I mean, is there, is there a problem in that? You know, saying, well, you know, humans produce this state of art and it's opposed to nature and, uh, you know, they're in some kind of conflict with each other. I don't have an answer. I, you know, if, I, if you think I'm a, uh, expecting, you know, the right answer, I, I don't have one. But the question is, is how different are we from the rest of nature in the way in which we try to build environments? Devin, you had your hand up. Um, whether we're talking about Darwin, about Huxley, or pretty much you know, any theme in this course, one of the things that always comes up is that the famous term, the struggle for existence. And yeah. in, in the quote from last night's reading, it says, what is often called the struggle of ex existence in society, in parentheses, I plead guilty to having used this term too loosely myself, is a contest not for a means of existence, but for a means of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And what I take from that is, you know, when you've got the when you've got the bees and the beavers, they're incredibly industrious, but mm. their their designs are based on necessity. Whereas if you look at something like the Parthenon, it's beautiful, yeah. exceptionally <laughs> wasteful, yeah. but yeah. just a token of yeah. our aesthetic and our yeah. our roles yeah. as a culture. And you know, and this 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 sentence doesn't just apply to things like architecture and art, mm -hmm. which we take as the aesthetic yeah. form of enjoyment, yeah. Yeah. but also to class struggle. It yeah. also describes why you know people continue to work harder so in theory they can gain more wealth the wealth does not secure them any more the, uh, any kind of subsistence living mm -hmm. but allows them to partake in more uh more enjoyment whether that be you know needlessly expensive wines prostitutes or cars you know it doesn't it's all it doesn't matter so mm -hmm. okay. okay i think i got that <laughs> uh yeah it, it's it is it is True that there's a uh, there's a, re a, a residual element in human building that goes over into from utility into self-expression. I mean, all the way back to those caves where some of the first brilliant uh, uh, paintings of horses and various you know the the, the cave paintings of southern France and various other places in the world that show, I mean, the cave itself was an environment of, so f of, of, of some sort where humans could get out of the elements and uh, create a better surrounding for themselves. But in those same locations is this kind of excess expression, this, this, this uh, residuum, this, this uh, uh, you know, this, this going beyond just the utilitarian. And that gets into the, the Parthenon. Why the Parthenon? Why not just a, 
this uh, the, uh, one of the most beautiful structures ever possibly created. What's the point of the pyramids? Uh, the great pyramids, yes, they they're mausoleums of so they're places of burial and so on. But why? What's this other this this excess that goes into the creation of this towering structure? That's human. That's that's very very human, and we don't know of cases like that in other organisms that I know of. There may be some crow or something that does something for itself and didn't need to, uh, that's, that's aesthetically motivated, but uh, not to my knowledge. But many people, of course, did see nature in Darwin's time and the beauties of nature in the flowers, the flora, and the expressions of beauty in uh, things like the bird of paradise as the same impulse to create something artistic that's beautiful for nothing other than beauty. And what does Darwin's theory do to that? There's no, there's no capacity within Darwin's evolutionary system uh, in the origin, uh, or I'm not sure of capacity, but there's, there's, it's not a phenomenon that is recognized by Darwin. The beauty of all these things has always comes back to some kind of function. The brilliance of the flower is to attract the bee, uh, whether it's, uh, or the brilliance of the bird of paradise is to attract the mate but there's always some kind of function that it comes back to. Okay, so, yeah, there, there, there is in these human environments something, something quite different, but also something quite consistent with natural building. Um, all right, so Huxley, uh, you know, he talks about the fact that uh, the cosmic process, process of nature, will constantly wear down what humans build. And, you know, he, all he has to do is just cite the ruins of the world. I mean, Troy had been discovered. Uh, many, many structures, uh, you know, Tintern Abbey, Wordsworth's beautiful site of his, his glorious poem, is itself an example of, you know, the destruction of nature, of natural forces, the fact that you know, if you leave the Empire still uh, building, eventually, if nobody does anything to that building, it'll, it'll fall over. It won't, it won't exist forever. These bridges that we build, you know, they're, they're, they're marvelous structures, and they last for, some of them, a couple of hundred years, or maybe less, some of them maybe more, but eventually they'll all fall down, because under the force of nature, they, where takes place. What is where? I mean, where is what, that's what mechan gets mechanical engineers really excited. Where, you know? W-E-A-R, you know, how does it take place? How, what, what are the structures? What are the ways in which things actually fracture? And, you know, they study this in a million different ways to try to understand it better. And why? To build a better, something that'll last longer under natural forces and natural stresses. That's, we study this stuff constantly. That's what we develop calculus and all the other methods that we use to kind of describe uh, natural phenomena. So in, in, in some ways, you're, you're fighting wear. You're fighting aging. You're fighting the process of, of nature. So this is, this is kind of the, 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 the crux of this, uh, this key first part of this essay fact that, you know, our cities, as uh, the bottom illustration here shows, you know, eventually will all come falling down. And what's the ultimate implication of this in Huxley's essay? What ultimately will happen to human civilization? Well, die out is probably not quite the right term, but eventually, as the cosmic process takes place, you know, millions or billions of years from now, uh, Earth will go the way of the rest of the cosmos, you know, it's, it's, we're not, we're not here forever. 
I mean, it's, it's a theoretical end because it's not going to happen, uh, we assume, within, you know, the immediate future. But his point is, is eventually this built environment and all the things that humans have brought that they think of as the norm of time, in some sense, will be gone. It'll, it'll be just, you know, prairies or grasslands or whatever happens uh, unless we do something really bad to the environment and <laughs> become something much worse. But, uh, you know, eventually the impact of humans uh, far enough in time will be gone. Sticking with this metaphor, even the most industrious gardeners will eventually lose their apples and gooseberries. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, after exactly. that. Yeah, it's, 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 we, we can't ultimately resist the cosmos and its, its forces. So it's a, it's a kind of a, there's a kind of biblical quality, if you will, to this essay, because it sort of brings people back to the fact that, you know, the dust to dust uh, saying, uh, it has a kind of scientific basis that, yes, eventually things will be back to what they were long before, or other forms, but, you know, this, this, this sense of humans as here forever, enduring forever, and so on is, you know, it's, 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 it's not accurate. Okay. Um, all right, then he gets into, uh, so, you know, he talks about the colony, uh, I don't know, uh, humans develop colonies. We have a kind of a romance with colonies. We think of colonies as, you know, these incredible new environments. But in fact, you know, colonies are pretty violent places of the intersections of different cultures and, you know, uh, one culture commonly dominates another. Yeah. So Huxley said that Man within, the morals taught by society, live along inside innate personality. So you, you create a colony which, cre which comes from culture, and culture has the axiom that you don't kill each other, that you kind no. of allow your fellow man to exist, no. and that the immediate consequence of this mm -hmm. is Malthusian population, because if you're not killing your fellow man, yeah. you just have unlimited expansion. So in this particular instance, while the technology points right, are true, right, right. this Malthusian expansion is about morals, and it's about the it consequence is. of non- yeah. Allowing that, um, and then he meant, the last point I'll make is he mentions too that that you know famous adage of do unto others as you would have them do unto you mm -hmm. doesn't really work, and it's unrealistic if you want to keep a civil society because if you if you commit a crime you don't want to be hanged you don't want to be put to death it, that just doesn't work. So if you want to maintain civil society, a lot of the adages that we're taught in our cultural framework aren't going to hold up in the long okay. run. Okay, so the so, uh, the the golden rule has uh, limits. Okay. Well, that's what the, the, the middle paragraph here is. On the other hand, within this colony, the enforcement of peace, which deprives every man of the power to take away the means of existence from another, simply because he is the stronger, would have uh, put an end to the struggle for existence between the colonists. And the competition for the commodities of existence, which would alone remain, is no check upon population. So this is where the ethical... Uh, so why is ethic? Why is ethics so important an issue in these colonies? Why does ethics, what, what do humans have that requires them to develop codes of ethical behavior? There would be a lot of chaos. Okay, okay. and where would that, what would that chaos, chaos come from? Just like a fundamental lack of rules or structure. Okay, um, and what does that mean, allow? It was kind of like what we were talking about with Hyde. If there were okay. no yes. morals, no structure, yeah. a lot of us would or could, I, I don't know, yeah, yeah, very no, well no. turn into little Hydes running around town okay. and <laughs> just like stomping on each other. So Well, there's yeah, so there's kind something of within, within the human psyche that, you know, is, is uh, aggressive. I mean, that's what he's talking about, is it not? And that's where Devin's point about the morals come in. Is, you know, humans, uh, humans have tendencies to, you know, uh, instinctual drives and so forth to do what they want to do. And among those things, uh, under 
unregulated circumstances, might makes right. If you want to take, if, if, if you are struggling for resources and the person who gets the resources wins, isn't that the way it works in nature? I mean, the natural environment of Darwin's world is, is a world in which, you know, survival of the fittest by any means possible. Doesn't mean that everything's fighting constantly, but, you know, if it comes to that, that's what happens. So, in human society, what would that do to human society? Well, I think he said it in, in the reference to Hyde. We, <coughs> uh, Hyde is a kind of a exaggeration, but, but, but you know, it, it, it captures something. What's that? It's an exaggeration because, well. like, <laughs> it, pro it probably is, but well. you never know. If you removed all restraints on everybody, what could happen? Yeah. You don't have much faith in people, do you? Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> well, they're made up of complex. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they're complex. They're, yeah. Okay. So this is a problem. Um, this is a problem that Huxley hits upon here. Is the garden population expansion, and when populations expand too far, the, the normal tendency to live uh, in harmony, if you will, begins to collapse. At least this is his theory. And that, you know, under circumstances where societies are really highly overpopulated beyond their capacity to uh, support, Huxley's argument is that uh, the tendency will be to you know, for the moral structure to collapse. Now that's, that's debatable. It's highly debatable. Uh, but uh, because, you know, we, we've had great depressions, we've had things, uh, periods, uh, you know, where uh, societies were under incredible stress and they didn't break down into just kind of, uh, you know, uh, physical, uh, uh, violent behavior. However, we do know that crime rates go up, don't they? When, when uh, resources become scarce, lots of things do happen. And uh, his argument here is that, <coughs> at least part of it, is that uh, these, these states that we create for ourselves, these, these built environments, as they become overpopulated, uh, they require, you know, Humans require, uh, they have to regulate themselves. And that's part of what their laws and all their civic laws and things like that. I mean, we have an incredible law code, don't we? Is it easier when you remove laws? Like, like you said, crime rates just shoot yeah. right up. Like if you look at somewhere after a hurricane or some kind of natural disaster where the people who enforce the okay, rules that's are, a, that's a good example. Yeah. When, when they're occupied with other things, immediately, yeah. like yeah. robbery is... Yeah. No big deal, People and you can just go away. into somebody else's yeah. house, and yeah. 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 No, it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is part of this, this society. We have an incredible law code, volumes. Where's that coming from? We didn't just do that just because somebody thought, oh, it'd be nice to do this. Uh, it's all been developed out of cases and cases and cases and. Uh, the, the, the need to develop, promulgate a, a, code, of, a code of behavior. And it's, it's rather extensive. It's huge. So we do self-regulate. Um, okay, so... So Huxley brings up the question of uh, humans selecting other humans. What is... How does this fit into this, this picture that he's drawing? The eugenics movement. Uh, Fran uh, uh, a number of people uh, who were, I think it's Francis Galton, uh, who were very eager and interested in developing uh, uh, sort of approaches to selecting or not, not in the sense of 
exterminating anything, but, but sort of in the, in the Butlerian sense of, uh, well, not in the Butlerian sense, because there they took people to court if they were, if they had bad genetic uh, makeup or, or, you know, expression of, they were weak in something uh, in one way or another. Uh, but this idea in the garden, of why does this connect to this garden imagery of humans selecting other humans? To get this perfect little society, to get this perfect big society, what would the last step be? Uh, what could the last step conceivably be? To yeah, yeah, uh, to apply these same principles to the inhabitants which would be uh, eugenics and the selection for strengthening the, strengthening the, uh, uh, the stock, if you will. And there were plenty of plans, plenty of groups in Huxley's day interested in exactly these kinds of uh, ideas. There was uh, this whole group, uh, the uh, uh, Eugenics Society of London, in the 1890s. It, it was quite active. And there were eugenics movements in the U.S. and these were all movements that were intended to look across the population, find ways of, you know, improving the, uh, the, 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 the common stock of humans. So you would get a kind of a Erewhonian, a society of Erewhonians, beautiful people who all were healthy and did the right thing and uh, fit into uh, the right spaces at the right time. And we've had endless science fiction works that have explored these sorts of things. But uh, it's, a, it's, it's an idea that really came out of the Darwinian age. So what does Huxley say about this? So he says here in section 15, he says, to return once more to the parallel of horticulture, in the modern world the gardening of men by themselves is practically restricted to the performance not of selection but of, of that other function of the gardener, the creation of conditions more favorable than those of the state of nature. Uh, so... Uh, He says here, I have further uh, shown cause for the belief, this is in uh, section 12, that direct selection after a fashion of the horticulturist, horticulturist and the breeder neither has played nor can play any part in the evolution of society, apart from other reasons, because I do not see how such selection could be practiced. Without a serious weakening, it may, it may be the destruction of the bonds which hold society t together. It strikes me that men who are accustomed to contemplate the active or passive extirpation of the weak, the unfortunate, and the superfluous, who justify that conduct on the ground that it has the sanction of the cosmic process, i.e. is following evolutionary principles, and is the only way of ensuring the progress of the race, who, if they are consistent, must rank medicine among the black arts and count the physician a mischievous preserver of the unfit. He's thinking of Erwan here. Yeah. I can. Uh, on whose uh, matrimonial undertakings the principles of the stud have the chief influence, whose whole lives, therefore, are an education in the noble art of suppressing natural affection and sympathy, are not likely to have any large stock of those commodities left. Uh, but without them there is no conscience nor any restraint on the conduct of men except the calculation of self-interest, the balancing of certain present gratifications against doubtful future pains, uh, and experience tells us how much that is worth. Every day we... S okay, well, so what's he, what's he getting at here? fact that we're far from <coughs> getting to a place where we are going to perfect the inhabitants of our garden because I don't think anyone can foresee any of us at a point in the near future 
calling a doctor a mischievous preserver <laughs> of the unfit. Well, doctors species. were, yeah, uh, doctors um, were un, un, unpopular. And, um, yeah, but today, um, though, I don't think yeah. that's anything that's going to happen anytime soon. So. Well, I mean, it, it, it goes back to the, the, the question that many people thinking about Darwin and the principles of Darwin uh, and the whole concept of domestication and so forth and applying those principles to humans think that somehow the human human society can somehow exercise some collective authority over who uh, over uh, the results of human uh, uh, reproduction, really. I mean, it sort of comes down to those terms, because uh, you know, if, if 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 you're thinking in an evolutionary sense, this is what uh, you might come upon as a way of managing human society. And Huxley's point here is that it would probably create the opposite effect of what you're trying to achieve. Because by exercising these kinds of powers over other people, you would destroy the bonds of society and you destroy the ethical basis of society. That's where the ethics comes back in here. Evolution and ethics. Evolution is not ethical. Evolution does not deliver ethical society. Ethics is something that belongs to the built environment. In some sense, it, it, it is an extension of the state of art. The state of ethics is part of that state, uh, the, the, ethical, the ethical codes. And they forbid the application of natural principles to all these elements of human life. So that's uh, when we come back down to the core question of evolution and ethics. It's that, you know, can, uh, can ethics be seen as uh, a way of uh, behaving according to nature? And Huxley's argument is emphatically it cannot. <laughs>